such a beautiful morning to worship. Amen. We want to say hello to those of you joining us online as well. Can we all stand to our feet? We're going to give God praise and worship this morning. Thank Him for all He's done in our lives.
hearts of gratitude.
Father God, we thank you for this amazing privilege to be in your house this morning, to be gathered together with other worshipers who wanna love and adore on you this morning, Lord God, and you deserve all the glory, all the praise. We give you our hallelujah this morning. You deserve all of our praise, Lord. We love you so much. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Isn't it so good to be together this morning, church? Yes. Amen. All right, before you take a seat, though, I want you to stand back up, turn around, say hello to someone you haven't seen in a little bit. Well, good morning, church. So glad to have you here with us in person and those of you worshiping with us online. Was that an awesome time of worship this morning? So, so grateful for Stephanie and Wyatt and G. Uh, you have a lion in those lungs. And it was great to hear those praises being lifted up to Christ this morning. Well, if you're new to CBC or you feel like you're new, we welcome you. We'd love to start a conversation with you. And so we wanna invite you out to the patio to our information tent right outside. There'll be pastors and, and staff there to greet you. We have a gift we'd love to give to you, just our way of saying thanks for being with us today and help answer any questions you might have. Those of you online, we see you. We wanna connect with you as well. So if you would just uh, text CPC Connect at 55444. We have a gift we'd love to send your way and just get to know you better as well. We're excited to be together today and next week as we kick off March, wanna remind you that we are going to be moving our second service a little bit earlier in order to allow for connection time between the services. So starting next week in March 6th, our service will move to 1045 instead of 11. You're in luck here at nine o'clock. Yours is remaining the same, uh, but we just want to let you know that that's happening. You might notice today there's a few less men because they're off on the men's retreat down at Mount Hermon. We've got about 130 guys down there. Pastor Ryan and Shane leading worship. I just got a text from Tyler this morning. He said that worship has been so powerful. The time there just with spiritual growth for the guys and connection. So want to be praying for them this morning as they're going to be sharing communion together and have having worship before they head back here. And we're excited to get to have Larry Vold here preaching for us this morning, but please be praying for the guys. You're gonna hear, uh, you're gonna hear a message from Tyler. He's got a quick little video message for us in just a couple minutes. And women, we also have a great opportunity for spiritual growth for you next weekend as there will be the IF uh, Gathering Conference that's happening on March 4th and 5th. It's not too late to sign up. It's an online conference. There'll be lots of women that are also hosting in their homes. So we encourage you to sign up. You can get your pass by just going on to cbcdanville.org and you'll get a discount on your pass. You can watch the talks, Jenny Allen and Christine Kane, Rebecca Lyons. They've got a huge lineup of awesome speakers next weekend. So I'd encourage you to sign up for that. You can watch throughout the rest of this year by just uh, getting a ticket. And so I encourage you to do that um, as well. Well, you know, you often hear us say that we are for the valley and that's because we believe that being for others, like God is for us, can really change the world. And we truly believe that. We live into that belief each week and we especially wanna thank you for your generosity that helps us to live that out. Especially right now, many of our hearts are broken over the situation that's happening in Ukraine. And over 70% of that country is actually people who profess Christ. And so we wanna be praying for our brothers and sisters that are in such danger right now. We are so grateful to get to partner with Convoy, Convoy of Hope, which is helping to set up disaster relief right now on the borders of Ukraine. This week we were also able, because of your generosity, to deploy $8,000 to an orphanage in Ukraine and they were able to get 71 children out safely. Um, and we are so grateful for that. They made it safely to Germany. And so I just ask for your prayers for all those orphans and their staff that are caring for them there. 
We've got lots of CPC family members and friends that have friends and family in Ukraine and would ask for your continued prayers. So let's pray together as we receive the offering. You can text to give or give online and just thank you for your heart for the world right now and especially for brothers and sisters in Ukraine. Let's pray together. God, we know that, Lord, your desire is for peace. And Lord Jesus, you are the Prince of Peace. And you can come into even areas of incredible unrest. And Lord, where their war is existing right now in Ukraine, we pray, Lord, for your protection. For the families and parents and children, Lord, that are in the trauma of war right now. For those that are hiding in subways and underground just to find safety. Lord, we pray for your protection and your care. Lord, we ask that you would enter in and Lord, that you might establish peace in places that it just doesn't seem possible, but Lord, we know it is because of you. We ask, Lord, that you would wrap your arms around all of these children, the orphans that were able to escape to Germany. Lord, that you would be with them, that you would continue to empower other relief organizations to come alongside people who are in desperate need right now. And Lord, we thank you that you are good, that, Lord, you are gracious, Lord, that you are sovereign, and we can trust in you and your hand on this world. And so, Lord, help us to be ambassadors of peace, we pray. Now, Lord, receive these gifts and help all of our gifts continue, Lord, to be multiplied, to be used to your glory, we pray. And we pray all of this in the strong name of Jesus, our risen and reigning Christ. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, we have a short message from Tyler, so take a look at this. Hi, this is Tyler coming to you from Mount Hermon with the CPC Men's Retreat. All of our 140-ish guys want to say hello to you real quick back at church. Say hello! Yes, I have to tell you, I'm under a tremendous amount of pressure right now. These guys are hungry. This is right before lunch, and they have made me promise that I do this in one take. So the first thing I want to do is say thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be up here. Thank you for the break. Thank you for the time away. Thank you for your prayers, because God is moving among us. Andrew McCourt, our pastor who's speaking this weekend, is on fire. Our worship team is on fire. Last night, Andrew gave an invitation after the first message, and a bunch of guys came to Christ after night one. That, like, never happens. I've never seen that at a men's retreat. So God is moving, and we're very, very grateful. Continue your prayers. Uh, speaking of great preachers, I also want to take this opportunity to introduce to you right now the man who is about to preach to you this morning, and that is Dr. Larry Vold. He is my mentor. He is either my, my spiritual father or my spiritual big brother. He's probably not old enough to be my spiritual father, but he's at least a big brother in the faith. He's a gifted Bible teacher. He has mercy and compassion gifts. He was a lead pastor at Three Crosses Church in Castro Valley uh, for about 25 years. And for many of those years, he was my own personal mentor. I absolutely love him. And he's going to bring you this message as we continue in our series called Jesus Stories. His message is coming to you from John chapter 4. He's going to teach about the woman at the well, and you are in for a treat. And so CPC back home, right now is your cue as he's walking on stage to give a warm, ruckus CPC welcome to Dr. Larry Vold. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, my goodness. You know, your pastor, he exaggerates everything, you know. I just love him so much. I love being with the CPC family. And look at you. What a beautiful congregation. It's so great to be preaching in front of people that don't have masks on. And, well, if you've got a mask on, it's okay. There's no, nothing wrong with that. But just to see faces and to see bodies, it's so great. And those of you that are online watching too, we're so happy that you're with us today. And I'm honored to be here in this great church. And the worship team this morning, wow, I was in tears down here. The Lord met me. I hope he met you in the same way, in a beautiful, beautiful way. I'm just so honored to be here. I love your church. You know, there's so many people in, our, in your church that I just would love to point out, but I don't have time to do all that. But I would say just... Love you all. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, you know, and I love your church's purpose statement, for the valley. 
I, when that came out a few years ago, actually Tyler gave me one of those big black shirts with the white letters. And I, it's one of my favorite t-shirts. I wear it all the time. You see, I live in Castro Valley, so it works out pretty good just to wear it around Castro Valley. But especially when I come out, I do a lot of uh, workout at the uh, 24-hour fitness in San Ramon. And so I Oh, if I can, I wear that shirt. And it always provokes some kinds of conversations with people. I've invited people to CPC when they've asked questions about what that means. And it's so cool to be a, a church that is for something, known for being for rather than being against. I think that's amazing. And then when I was watching, and my wife and I, we love watching online. We love Pastor Tyler's sermons and anybody who speaks and Shane and the worship team. It's amazing. We love doing that. And, and last week, I heard Pastor Ryan get up and say, and he said what Kathy said this morning. He said, when we're for others like God is for us, we can change the world. And I thought, that is so good. That is so rich. And I want to just kind of borrow a little bit, another for language for you today that will maybe jump us into a, a, a beautiful theme that I hope you'll follow along in John chapter four. If you don't have your Bible open to it, you might want to get there right now. As Pastor Tyler said, last week we started in John chapter three, and it was the story of Nicodemus, and today we're in John chapter four, and the story of the woman at the well. She doesn't even have a name in the scripture. She had a name, but we don't know what her name is. And what I love about that is that maybe this is going to be you in the text today. You're going to find yourself in this, like this woman in the well. I think all of us are going to see ourselves there today. So allow me to read a fairly lengthy portion, verses 1 through 26, and then we're going to just dive in and look at some beautiful principles that come out of this text. The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar. Near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph, Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as did also his sons and his flocks and herds? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to come, keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. In fact, you have had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. This is the word of the Lord. This is an amazing text of scripture, this, without a doubt. And if you're a church that is for the valley, then can I just introduce to you something that is the main idea of this text today? And that is that Jesus is for everyone. Do you believe that today? 
Jesus is for everyone. Now, the unique context of John chapter four is that the disciples, the followers of Jesus, the closest in the circle of Jesus, they really couldn't have said that statement, that Jesus is for everyone. Their statement would have said something like this, Jesus is for almost everyone. But you see, this text reminds us today that Jesus is, in fact, for everyone. Let me give you uh, just the the beautiful uh, verse that this comes out of, verse 10. Jesus says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. What Jesus wants every one of us to know today is that he is the one that can quench our ultimate thirst in life. It doesn't matter who you are, where you're going in life, where you've been in life, the problems of your life, the tragedies of your life, the missteps of your life, the sin of your life, whatever's gone on in your life, every one of us need Jesus this morning, equally. There's nobody that needs Jesus more than anybody else. We all have an equal need for Jesus. And I love this idea that if CPC is for the valley, then you can believe that Jesus is for everyone and that no one should be excluded. There would be no one you would pass by, no one you would say, not him, not her, no group that you would say, not them, no family member, no work colleague, no politician, no entertainer. No one should be excluded from knowing and following Jesus Christ, right? Because everybody needs Jesus. That's because Jesus is for everyone. I wanna show you four observations out of this little encounter today that maybe will bless us and help us to see our own lives and our own context where we're in. This is uh, very simple, what I wanna share with you today, And and I hope that what we'll talk about will be something that will propel you into having a difference in your family relationships, the people you live with, in your neighborhood, and so on. First, I want you to observe how Jesus comes to us and how he comes to this woman. Uh, And by the way, why does Jesus come to any of us? In verse 26, Jesus declares, I who speak to you am he. Uh, If you're taking notes or you just wanna log in in your mind, the only reason Jesus wants to come to any of us is to reveal how good he is, reveal how powerful he is, reveal how relevant he is. He wants to reveal himself to us today. And this is so good, it's so rich and so important for us. Now when I say Jesus comes to us, like he came to this Samaritan woman, I mean two specific things. First of all, I mean that he makes the first move. Jesus initiates, this is the plan of God, this is the way God always works. He doesn't wait for us to make the move. He makes the first move. This is the amazing thing about God. God is always on the move. God is working even when we don't see him working. In his reconciling work, the scripture clearly reveals that God is the one who initiates. Last week, Pastor Tyler brought us into John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. This is the initiation of God. This is God coming to us. I'm meeting you first. I'm getting there first. This is, this is what God does. In fact, if we go back just to John chapter one, we can just look at a couple of scriptures here. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. John 1, 14. This is God, once again, initiating. God sent his son, Jesus. He took on a human form and he came and lived among us. 2,000 years ago, the real person of Jesus Christ. We're gathered here today because we believe that real person of Jesus is still alive and that he's still showing up, and that he's still initiating with people in your neighborhood, in your workplace, in this culture, in our world. He's showing up in Ukraine. He's showing up in Russia. He's showing up everywhere in this world, and it's an amazing thing what he does. In fact, right here in chapter four, verse four, it says, now he had to go through Samaria. Remember the Apostle John, he's writing this years later, and John is telling us something very important here. He's saying that this is the intent of Jesus. He had to go through Samaria. Why? Because there was someone there that he wanted to meet, someone there that he had his mind on, someone there that he needed to show God's love to, the love of the Father. And this is, the, this is always the work of Jesus. By the way, he's also taking his disciples on a little field trip because the disciples wouldn't have gone through Samaria. This is why John 4, 4 is so important. If you were a Jew living in Jesus' day and you wanted to go to northern Galilee where it says in chapter four, verse one, that, uh, that Jesus was leaving Jerusalem to go up to Galilee, you would go due east 
and then you would go north, and then you would go west, and you would bypass this area known as Samaria. And the reason you would do that is because you couldn't stand the people that lived there. Now, there's some of us that have a similar thing. There are some places where we don't want to go because we don't like the people there. There are some people that we kind of distance ourselves from. It even happens in churches where we kind of avoid people. We don't want to sit in one section because that person might be there. <laughs> now, you know, don't look around. Don't just uh, do anything like that. But we, we have a tendency to avoid certain people. Jesus is going to Samaria for a woman there, and he's also wanting his disciples to see what's gonna take place with this woman. Of course, we read in the text, they're off buying lunch when Jesus is having this encounter, which is a whole other story. We'll get to that maybe a little bit. But back to the point. Jesus comes to us. He makes the first move. This is what God always does. Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were what? Still sinners. He didn't wait for you to get cleaned up. Didn't wait for you to get a better life. I talk to people all the time that think that, they, that God wants to clean them. God wants them to clean their lives up first and then they can come. They're not ready to meet God because they're not cleaned up. God doesn't want you to clean up. He wants to meet you first and then let him do the cleanup job in your life. That's how it works. I love how 1 John 4, 9 says this. It says, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Not that we love God, but that God loved us. This is always God's posture, always leaning out, always saying, come to me, come to me. God's favorite word is come. He wants us to come. And he always initiates. This is so beautiful about our Lord. And then down in verse 19, we just take it one more. He loved, we love because he first loved us. This is the only reason why we love. He first loved us. So what, what this means is that when Jesus comes to us, he makes the first move. We see that. And also, he meets us where we are. He meets us where we are. And this is so good. I love the fact that Jesus knows where thirsty people hang out. And that's where Jesus is. He's waiting for this woman. He's there first. But he's also knowing that that's where she would be. You know, Jesus shows up in the strangest of places, doesn't he? I mean, usually people think the only place you can find Jesus is in a church. <laughs> and I've found that there are a lot of churches where you could go to and, and never meet Jesus at all. I mean, there's, and there's conventional Christian churches where you could go and not necessarily meet with the risen Christ. I'm grateful, it was the moment I walked in here this morning, at 7.30 in the morning, the worship team was up here just practicing, but they were worshiping. I felt the presence of Jesus right here in this place. That's why you're here today. It's amazing that you can come to a place like this, but watch this. He's not just in churches like CPC. He's showing up and meeting people in the aftermath of death of a loved one, drugs, divorce, emptiness, desperation, heartache, loneliness, hospital rooms, treatment clinics. He's everywhere. He's not just waiting. He's pursuing us. I don't know if you've ever read 19th century uh, Francis Thompson's poem or ode called The Hound of Heaven. It's, it's rather a famous uh, ode. You might wanna look at it later. It's online, you can go there. It's about 182 stanzas and it's pretty dense poetry. And I'm not really a poet, but there's some statements that the hound of heaven makes about this amazing reality. This, Francis Thompson was a young man who lived in comfortable means but fell out of this life of comfortable, uh, comfortability through the vice of drugs, ending up in wallowing in the filth of the slums of London back in the 19th century, early 19th century, uh, and then he found redemption, and he wrote this beautiful, beautiful ode to this idea of God being the hound of heaven. Uh, he, he starts the, the poem saying this, I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinth ways of my own mind, and in the mist of tears I hid from him and under running laughter, I vastayed hopes. I sped and shot, precipitated adown titanic glooms of chasmed fears from those strong feet that followed, followed after. Pretty dense, huh? <laughs> I love how it ends. Listen to this. This is God speaking. Ah, oh, fondest, blindest, weakest, I am he whom thou seekest. Thou dravest love 
from thee who dravest me. Uh, that's old English for you, you drove love from yourself, you who drove it from me. God says, this is, I pursue people that need me. I show up when nobody else is there. Have you experienced his presence lately? Have you had that experience? This woman at the well where he shows up, he comes to us. He comes to us. And the fact that he comes to us reminds us of many places I'm thinking of people in my own mind right now. I'm thinking of Roe Beep, a woman in our church who, who sat in her driveway one night uh, for three hours contemplating taking her life, wondering which way she would go to do it. Should I drive my car off a cliff? Should I take pills and alcohol? She was just contemplating that until she heard the sweet, small whisper of God in her heart saying, trust me. That opened a little arena for her to begin to explore the gospel. She showed up at church because someone had invited her to church and there in that church happened to be a Sunday where people were being baptized and the story of faith was going out and, and Robeep gave her life to Jesus that day. I think of Virginia who, who in the terrible aftermath of her son's death when he was just 20 years old and it was her only son and she was a, 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 a single woman how she was torn apart by this tragic loss and through meeting the body of Christ and through getting to know her myself, eventually she also became a follower of Christ. Jesus shows up. I think of Andrew who met Godwin living on the streets of Hayward. He was a drug addict, a, a 24-year-old drug addict, starving for food one day and he cried out. He said, God, I'm so hungry. God, if you're really real, would you just, I need something to eat. And he walked around the corner of a, of a liquor store and there was a bag on the ground and he looked in the bag and it was full of vegetables. <laughs> and I guess he thought, well, maybe God's vegetarian. I don't know, like, so he, <laughs> he picks up the bag and he starts eating these vegetables and at the bottom of the bag is a Gideon New Testament. Somebody had left a bag of vegetables with a hope that someone would read the gospel of Jesus Christ and Andrew was powerfully converted and his drug addiction was immediately removed. I mean, he has an incredible story. He's in a small group that I meet with every week. I think of the story of Amani. Amani uh, came to our church. We have a little coffee shop in our church and a lot of people come and work there and Amani was meeting a business person on a Sunday in our church cafe and as she's sitting there waiting for her business colleague to come, because that's where they decided to meet, she's looking around wondering where are all these people going out of the cafe? And she could hear music in the background. So finally she leans over and asks somebody at another table, where are all those people going? And the person said, they're going into church. <laughs> she didn't even know it was a church. <laughs> she came from a Muslim background. She was there to meet a business partner and the person at the table said, why did you come into church with us? And she said, no thanks. The person didn't show and she left. But she couldn't stop thinking about what she experienced that day. And as a Muslim, she thought it was disrespectful to go into a church that had already begun its worship. And so she decided to come on time the next week. <laughs> and she was there and she heard the gospel and she went for a few more weeks and eventually a man, he gave her heart to Christ. Jesus shows up. He, he, he's inexplicably present. I, I think of the Old Testament story of Hagar. And you know the story, right? Sarai and Abram had decided that they had a better plan because God wasn't coming through with his promise. And so let's, let's have Abraham have relations with the Egyptian handmaid. Both of them agreed, Sarai and Abram. And so that happens and Hagar becomes pregnant. And now Sarai's not so happy about Hagar being around, being pregnant. She's carrying what looks like the promise. And there's conflict and there's problems. And, and there's, Hagar can't stand it. So she runs away in anguish and despair. Genesis 16, she's out somewhere and the angel of the Lord, this is the pre-incarnate Christ we believe, shows up. Seeing her in her misery and says, I will, I will bless your descendants too. You're gonna have lots of descendants and gives her a word of encouragement. And I love what she says. She names God this. She says in Genesis 16, do we have it there? He says, you are the God who sees me. I have now seen the one who sees me. There's something amazing when you realize that God sees me. God sees who I am. Notice 
that deep down inside of us, when we know God sees us, really sees us, something changes. And I love how Jesus, in this text, is so tender to this woman. Uh, He knows she's thirsty, and so he approaches her with her thirst issue. And he says, he says, can I have a drink? (laughs) I love that about Jesus. He's so disarming. He's not there to punish her or push her. He's there to just invite her. So just back up for a second. He comes to us. Why? To reveal himself. And he does this by making the first move and he meets us where we are, which leads us into the next little point here. And that is that not only does Jesus come to us, but notice that Jesus knows us. I mean, does he know us? Oh boy, does he know us. I mean, Jesus knows the stuff we'd rather not talk about in our lives. Now in this text, I see four things that Jesus knows about this woman in this situation that I think gives a little credibility to what is about to happen, okay? First of all, Jesus knows our biases. He, know, he knew this woman's bias too. Uh, she says, wait, well, hold on. You know, you're, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. We don't have anything in common here. In fact, we don't even like, we're like the Hatfields and McCoys. We don't trust each other. We don't talk to each other. Why are you, as a Jewish man, asking me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? And of course, I don't have time to go into all the background, but I think most of us, if you don't know, you can read about this in 2 Kings 17, where Israel was a divided kingdom, northern Israel, southern Israel. And in 2 Kings chapter 17, we know that there was finally, after all the prophets had said, you guys got to repent, northern Israel, no, nah, they didn't repent. So God sends the Assyrians under the leadership first of a guy by the name of tiglath Pileser. feel sorry for him in kindergarten if you had to write that name out. But then another guy, follow, he dies, and another guy, Shalmaneser, king, comes in of the Assyrians, and they, they deport the northern Israel, many of them living in the Samaritan area, they deport them out to, to Assyria. And this is what all conquering kings do. They deport, and then they, you know, they bring in their own people, and they intermingle, and over time, of course, You've got the intermingling of the Assyrians with the Jewish people, and pretty soon it's, there's ethnic blending and all this stuff going on. And by the time that Jesus walks on the scene, there's such rancor and, and, and hate for each other, it's unbelievable. And that's why, by the way, Jesus took his disciples through that area. He, there was no way that Jesus was gonna go around when he could go through. Now, there's a sermon in itself right there. Are you trying to go around or are you going to go through? Jesus takes his disciples through. He knows our bias. He knows the things that are holding us back. He also knows our emptiness. Jesus says in verse 13 of John 4, he says, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. Why do people keep running back to the things that never satisfy them? I'm thinking of a conversation I had with a woman about a month ago. She's battled with a certain addiction drinking, and her life just continues to just swirl in this problem of going back, going back, going back, going back, going back. Why why do we go back? Why do we go back to the things that we know don't ultimately satisfy? Well, we have addiction issues. We have to get through those things, but a lot of times we're just hoping that we finally hit the lotto with the thing that we think will make us happy. He knows our emptiness, He knows the mess we've made of our lives. Now, I used to read this passage and I come to verse uh, 17 where he asks, go bring your husband. She says, I have no husband. Jesus says to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands. I used to read that thinking, ah, that feels a little harsh. (laughs) You know, like if I was talking to somebody at the airport, I'd say, hey, have I met your wife? No, no, no. And I know, well, no, you don't have a wife. You have five girlfriends. You know, like that would would seem really kind of like a, a, a punch in the face. But if you know about what Jesus is doing here, th- th- this is what hits me, and it just it hits me like a ton of bricks. What Jesus is doing here is he knows about her. I'm gonna save that. I'm gonna save that because I'm gonna stop right here and just remind all of us that we're like this woman too. Uh, Walker Percy, the great novelist, he says it this way. He says, we are all ruins, pilgrims in the ruins. Shames, Glories and shames at the same time. Pilgrims in the ruins. That's us. 
if you, if you thin slice our life, you might see some good things. But if you look at all of what we've done in our lives, oh, it's a different story. And Jesus is simply pointing out, ma'am, I know everything about you. I, I know all the stuff you've tried to hide. I, I know your bias. I know your emptiness. I know the mess you've made of your life. In fact, he also knows, let me just give you one more. He knows the convoluted religious beliefs that we often cherish to our own demise. You know, is it worship in Jerusalem or worship in, at Mount Gerizim? The Samaritans had a temple at Mount Gerizim. In fact, you can still go to Samaria and there are Samaritan worshipers there this day. Now, right now. Samaritans believed that they actually had a more pure view of the Old Testament. And they had a temple. Remember in the, the, is, when Israel came into the promised land, Deuteronomy 27, 28, you know, you had half of the Israelites on one mountain, Mount Gerizim, calling out blessings. If you obey God, you will be blessed. And then the other half of Israel on Mount Ebal, and they were crying out the curses. If you disobey God, this is what's gonna happen. The moral law of God. You honor him, you'll be blessed. If you dishonor him, you'll be cursed. This is, this is the Old Testament, Old Covenant, which, praise God, we have a new covenant. But he knows the convoluted religious belief. Is it Jerusalem? Is it Gerizim? No, he says, he says ma'am, actually, true worship is only about the heart. The Father is really seeking people that just worship from the heart. It's really not about this place. It's not about this location. It's about the heart. It's what's going on in here. And he knows all this. But the amazing thing about this, that Jesus' encounter with the woman, that he knows he knows our bias, he knows our emptiness, he knows the mess we've made of our lives, he knows that we're, we have stupid beliefs that carry us into all kinds of nonsense. But here's, here's the beautiful thing, number three, if you're taking notes. He, he loves us. Now, I said back up a minute ago, I said, it seems a little harsh that Jesus would say, I know about your life. But here's the amazing thing. Jesus doesn't say it condemningly. He's just saying, I know. In fact, this woman knows she's so loved. She knows that this is something revolutionary happen, happening to her in this moment. Despite knowing her, he's still showing love to her. Despite, despite all these things. Stephen Garber, in his book, Visions of Vocation, says that there is nothing we are asked to do that requires more of us than to know and love at the same time. You see, the, the, reason, the reason we hide stuff from people that we love is because we figure if they knew these things, they would stop loving us, right? And so there are some of us that have like little secrets going because we don't want people that love us to know these things because we don't want them to stop loving us. But the amazing thing about the Lord Jesus is that he knows all that stuff and he still loves us. This is what she caught in this interaction with her. He was exposing her, but he's loving her. I love what J.I. Packer says in his book, Knowing God, and Stephen Garber talks about this. Listen to this. God knew the worst about us before he chose to love us. Do you believe that? Okay. And therefore, no discovery now can disillusion him about us in the way that we are so often disillusioned about ourselves and quench his determination to bless us. He took knowledge of us in love. That is so amazing to know that he knows everything and his posture over me is love. By the way, that's true for those standing outside of faith looking in, but it's also true for those who are on the inside looking out, you and me. Jesus does not change his posture toward us when we stumble or fall into sin or even run into sin. I've, I've been reading a book I highly recommend, Dane Ortland's book, Gentle and Lowly. Anybody? The Heart of Christ for Sinners and Sufferers. He talks about Hebrews 7.25, which says, Christ is able to save completely those who come to God through him. We believe that. Because he lives to intercede for them. Dane Ortland continues, listen carefully. We tend to have some small pockets of our lives where we have difficulty believing the forgiveness of God reaches. We say we are totally forgiven and we sincerely believe our sins are forgiven, pretty much. But there's that one deep, dark part of our lives, even our present lives, 
that seems so intractable, so ugly, so beyond recovery. But Hebrews 7.25 describes how Christ is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Meaning that God's forgiving, redeeming, restoring touch reaches down into the darkest crevices of our souls, those places where we are most ashamed, most defeated. More than this, those crevices of sin are themselves the places where Christ loves us most. His heart willingly goes there. His heart naturally goes there. His heart is most strongly drawn there because he saves us completely. (sighs) I don't know how that resonates with you, but for me, I am so grateful that I come to the Lord Jesus Christ who comes to me. He shows up. He initiates. He knows everything about me, yet his banner over me is love. He's not shaking his finger. He's not waiting. Come on, Larry, you can do a little better here. How many of us think that the posture of God in our lives, the posture of Jesus is like, you know, come on, you can do better. That's not Jesus' posture. Jesus enters into the places where we feel so sinful. And that brings us to the the beautiful thing of this whole passage. And that not only does Jesus come to us, he knows us, he loves us, but watch this, he, he transforms us. He transforms us. Through believing in him, we are transformed. Her testimony, verses 29 and 39, we don't have time to go into the rest of the story, but you know, she goes out and she tells the people of her town, you gotta come meet this guy. What does she say to him, to them? Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Her testimony, remember we thought, oh, Jesus is being a little harsh. No, her testimony is, he knows everything. This is what set her free. Why could she be so excited to point to him as the Messiah, but the fact that she knew everything about, he knew everything about her. And she revels in that. She's not afraid of it. You let the Lord Jesus embrace you in the sin of your life. Now, I'm not suggesting that Jesus wants to keep us in areas of sin in our life, not at all. But his grace is going to help us through. This is called the transformed life. This is sanctification. Uh, This is is the water that Jesus talked about that would spring up to eternal life, verse 14. Uh, Maybe you've seen this in other places in John. For example, if you just go over a couple pages to John chapter 7, Jesus talks about this even more specifically. Let's look at it there. John chapter seven. On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said, this is the feast of tabernacles. Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. And then it goes on to say, by this he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. So the transformation we're talking about is believing so that the spirit may enter in. That we're not just trying to work harder to be better moralists in our walk in this world, but when you come to Jesus, which some of us may be doing today, he's met you, he's shown you that he knows you, you are convinced that he loves you, and now it's time for you to take the step and say, I believe you, Lord, I receive you, Lord, into my life. Because in the moment of you receiving him, you get the power to live a new life. By this he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Remember, the spirit didn't come till Pentecost. And John is writing this in retrospect, knowing that the spirit of God, in fact, came. Listen, believing results in the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Remember we talked about the old covenant and the new covenant? Ezekiel 36. This is the new covenant prophesied Hundreds of years before the Spirit came, God says through the prophet Ezekiel, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you a heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and to be careful to keep my laws. You see, we desire to keep the law of God as a result of the new work of God in our hearts. Christianity is not a moral construct where we just try to get better lives and we get a little therapy along the way. You know, God helps us achieve our dreams. 
That's not biblical Christianity. Biblical Christianity is realizing that we are in desperate need of a savior and our sins can only be forgiven in him. And when we receive that gift of life, he sends his spirit and watch this, moves us to follow his decrees, to want to follow the ways of God. It's a beautiful thing. John Newton, who wrote the lyrics of the great hymn, Amazing Grace, we've all sung it a million times. He was also known for saying this. I'm not what I ought to be. I'm not what I want to be. I'm not yet what I hope to be in the world to come. Nevertheless, I'm not what I used to be. And by God's grace, I am what I am. That's the transformed life. You know, is your life perfect? No. You know, you wanna look at my life? No, it's not perfect. Ask my family, ask my neighbors. I'm not perfect. Ask people in my church. But I'm on a road that is leaning into and a heart wanting with all my heart to follow the Lord. So, CPC. I hope the story of Jesus in this encounter, of the, in the, this encounter with this woman will leverage your outreach to this community th- through believing that Jesus is for everyone. And we're about to enter our mission field again just in a few minutes. But there may be somebody here today that has become the object of Christ's mission field right now. If you've never met Christ, right now is your moment because he's here and he's already been speaking to you and he's already shown you things in your life that you need a relationship with the living God. Let's pray together. Let's go to the Lord right now. Lord, I pray for anyone here today that needs a relationship with you. And for all of us, Lord, even as followers of you, those of us who are, that we would draw closer to you. Thank you for loving us despite knowing us. But Lord, for that one or two or whoever is here today that needs to start with you, would you give them the grace and faith to believe right now, to trust in you, to admit that they're a sinner and they need a savior. And if that's you, wherever you are in this beautiful room, or listening online, watching online, you can pray with me right now. You can say, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner, but I'm learning and believe that you love me and that you died for me and that you rose again from the grave. And so Jesus, Jesus, would you come into my life Would you transform me? Thank you, Jesus. And Lord, I pray for this beautiful family of CPC, Lord, that this would continue to be a a powerful, impacting church in the valley. Bless its dear pastor, Pastor Tyler, and all the staff and everyone who works diligently. Thank you, Jesus. We pray all this in your name. Amen. Amen. Today, I saw Pastor Tyler do this last week. I said, I want to take one of these yes packets. Today, if you opened your heart to Christ, if you prayed to receive Christ, we have this little packet called yes. I said yes to Jesus. On your way out, they'll be on the table in the back there on the way out. I think there might be some people even standing out there that might have them. If you need, just say, I want that packet. Get it. It'll help you just start your walk with Christ. There's some beautiful resources in here. This is a beautiful thing. So just grab that on your way out. Oh man, I tell you, what a blessing to be here with all of you today. You know, um, when in our church, when the men go away, you know, the wives and mothers seem to do okay at home. Um, but, but when the women go away, it's a disaster. So we're praying that these men will come back just fueled up and, you know, ladies or mothers, wives, you know, you can pretend that it was kind of hard to have them away, but um, just be soft with them, okay? But I'm praying for God to just do a, a great work. I love you all. I thank you so much for being here today. Let's stand together, and I'll just give you a benediction. Now may, now may the love of the Lord Jesus, the love of the Lord Jesus, who has been here with us today, go with us give us the privilege this day, this week, 
to bring the news of the gospel to someone we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have an amazing day.